Stand with me. As we read Genesis, the 12th chapter, starting at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. That's the highlight. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. And then Genesis, the 17th chapter. For the sake of time, going right down to verse 4 through 6. Genesis 17, 4 through 6. And God is speaking to him again, reinforcing this, this, this covenant that he first declared to him when he's 75. Now he's 99. And God says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations come of you, and kings shall come from you. Father, thank you again for this word. Thank you for your people. Thank you that you give us eyes to see ears to hear, hearts to receive, but then also a mind to walk out your word in our lives. Father, I thank you for revelation, information, but more, even more so impartation by the Spirit of God to help us bring our lives up to the level of your word and not bring your word down to the level of our lives. Your word, let it be a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this is part two of Nation Builders. Again, this is uh, also where this is our Super Bowl Sunday in terms of the football Super Bowl, but also we're, we're making sure that people have soup in their bowls by helping us to be a blessing um, to help and, and, and come against food insecurity. And we're also, uh, many of us are wearing today, are wearing um, teams that may be one day by and by. When the morning comes, might be the Super Bowl. Okay, we had a new member. We we had a new we had a new members fellowship the other night, and I had each of the new members tell us something um, uh, unique about them. And um, and then one of the young men, he he just won't go on record. Who 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 did he love? What team did he love? Huh? He said he said just for the record, I love the New Orleans Saints. And I hate the Cowboys. Okay. So it's some Cowboy lovers here, but it's a, I mean, people, feel, people got extreme feelings about the Cowboys. Like extremes. Okay. Y'all, y'all know I really don't have a dime in that quarter, so uh, I'm, I'm just doing what I can do. Try to support the vision of the house. Praise the Lord. So this is part two of Nation Builders. Uh, and we talked about nation building, understanding that when countries go into another country, many times to supposedly rescue them, but many times to sometimes overthrow a government or stop oppression, as the United States has been involved in, and then we go in and then try to change that nation to become like our nation. It's a concept called nation building. And one of the biggest concerns even most recently, uh, even when we went into Afghanistan, a lot of people, a lot of politicians say, we don't want to get involved in nation building. Because nation building takes a long time. It takes a lot of money to try to take one culture, make it another culture, try to take uh, people who think one way and get them thinking another way. But all that is, a, is what nation building is all about. We tried to do nation building in Vietnam, in, in Iran, in Iraq which really didn't work, and even in Afghanistan. Because as soon as we left, Taliban took back over, and they go back to their same old way of doing things. God told Abraham he would make a new nation out of him. And so Abraham was a nation builder. And I'm saying the same way that God made Abraham to be a nation builder. Jesus was a nation builder, and we are the nation of Christ. We are the nation in the kingdom of God. But also he wants us to continue to be nation builders with our families and with our spheres and our realm of influence. And so many of us, we're called to be nation builders. We said that nation building starts in a place and Abraham was going to have to leave the place where he was and go to a new place. 
he actually was picking up an assignment that his father had started. His father, we saw from Genesis 11, he was headed for the land of Canaan, but he stopped in Haran and he settled there. And a word we gave you there is that don't settle. Don't settle in a place that's not God's best for you. Don't settle because you're too tired to keep on moving. Don't settle because you think this is good enough. Go on and have everything God wants you to have. Be everything God wants you to be. Do everything that God wants you to do. And don't settle because Terah settled. Even though he lived for 205 years, he died still in the land which, just was, which was just supposed to be a pit stop. That's like, that's like parking when, when, when you stop at a dress area on the interstate and you decide to live there. That's not a place you live. It's a place you pass through. Look at somebody and say, I'm just passing through. So the Bible tells us that Abraham had to obey God. In Hebrews 11 and 8 says Abraham obeyed and he went out to a place that he would eventually receive as an inheritance. So nation building involves many times moving from one place to another place. Many of us, God has had to change our, our demographics. He had to change our geography to get us to the place that he would bless us. Some of us, that was, that was for a city. Some of us, that was a job. Some of us was, was uh, uh, moving out of, from one church to another church. But we had to get to the place that God wants us to be because a lot of people don't understand this. But the blessings of the Lord are geographic. A lot of people don't understand. I hear a lot, a, a lot of people take that for granted. I heard, to me, it was very prideful. I heard, a, I heard a, a preacher say one time who had a great ministry in a particular city. He said, he said I know the anointing that's on my life. He said, I'll go anywhere and be successful. And, and I, sometimes I think to say that is to be a little prideful because God has an assignment for us. And he puts us in particular places. And he blesses us based upon us being many times in the place he told us to be. The Bible says that when Abraham got the revelation about Jehovah Jireh, he, uh, he said Je he, when he went to the mountain and the Lord caused the, 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 the ram to be in the bush, that he was able to substitute the ram for his son who he went up there to kill. He, he said he called the name of the place, not even the name of the, his God. He called the name of that place Jehovah, I mean J Jireh. He called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, meaning in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. God's provision shows up in places. Don't, don't, don't lose that. It's really important to understand it because a lot of people understand that and they will get from the place of the blessing for their life. Doesn't mean God's not there. He didn't tell you to be there. And God's blessing will be upon you when you are fulfilling his assignment in a particular place. Just like the military is not going to bless you when you go AWOL. Okay? They're not going to continue to say, no, no, you, you, you go, you're going to get arrested. Okay, you're going to have charges brought against you because you're supposed to be stationed at Fort Jackson and you just decide you just want, you, you want to move to Fort Hood. That ain't how this works. Well, when you, I have heard people say stuff like, well, we all still in God's family. Yes, there's no question that you're in God's family, but, you're in, but are you fulfilling God's assignment? Because he's he determined the times and the bounds of our habitation. So when we get saved also, a relocation takes place in the realm of the spirit. Colossians 1 and 3, he delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son. So it starts with a place. Second, we said nation building is about people. Everybody say people. Because it's people that move and shape history. And when God called Abraham, he would begin a new nation through him. He would let him know this is bigger than you. As much as you want to be blessed, as much as God wants to bless you, it's not just about you. Every one of us is blessed to be a blessing. Every one of us should be positive, positively affecting somebody else's life. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children and his children's children. And, and, and you, every man should be a 3G man. Your generation, okay, your children's generation, and ideally your grandparents' generation. Some of you may not have children and grandchildren, but you got nieces and nephews. There's another generation following you who you need to be imparting to, who you need to be helping to shape. Help them understand that take the bonnet off the head when they go to the supermarket. They won't know if the prior generation don't tell them. They think this is cool. And it's not cool. It's trifling. I'm sorry, y'all not get on my soapbox about that thing. Right? So when God called Abraham, it was going to make a new nation. He let him know it's going to be bigger than you. 
is bigger than you. How much did I get on this point? God told me it was going to be bigger than you. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, you are a chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation, his own special people. Why? That you may proclaim the praises. You are his people so you can proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You didn't used to be a people, 1 Peter 2 and 10, but now you are the people of God. Now you have obtained mercy. And now you are God's in God's family. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, I'm moving quickly, but verse 12, New Living Translation says, you were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel. I was, I, I was watching someone yesterday. Uh, I happened to be watching some Christian television, and y'all, I'll have no problem with Israel. And, uh, and he was talking about how much God's, going, God's blessing us for blessing his people Israel and all that. And, and he kept saying, you know, us Gentiles, us Gentiles, us Gentiles, us Gentiles, us Gentiles, those are God's people. And we're the Gentiles, those are God's people. And I said, keep reading the scripture, man. Even Paul says, you once were Gentiles in the flesh. You were. You know what Gentiles mean? It means barbarians. It means ignorant people outside the covenant. That's why he said, even Paul said, you were Gentiles in the flesh. Okay? But now, because of the blood of Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We are one in Christ Jesus. So Ephesians 2.11 says, you were, uh, look, he says, he says that you Gentiles, you were Gentiles in the flesh. You used to be outsiders. Everybody say, I'm not an outsider anymore. You were, called un, you were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, that was then, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. But you understand the promises that he made to them now refer to us as well. That's good to know. Otherwise, every time you read this old, the Old Testament, you got to say, well, that, uh, you shall be the head, not the tail. Oh, that don't apply to me. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the, uh, but that don't apply to me. No, all that applies to me. The Lord is my shepherd. Wasn't just David's shepherd, not just a Jew's shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, now that I'm part of the promise, when I walk through the waters, they won't overflow me. When I go through the fire, they won't burn me. The Lord will fight my battles. Oh, come on now. You got to see yourself in the scriptures. It's not us and them. This is us. Oh, man, my God, I'm going to preach that. This is us. Glory to God. So the church like Abraham and Jewish people are now a new nation, which is supposed to be one nation under God. It's supposed to be indivisible. It's supposed to be with justice. For all, liberty and justice for all. Let me move on here because the third thing, so we said it's, it's a place, part of this nation building, it, it, it involves a place, it involves a people. The next thing it involves, even as I mentioned in the often exhortation, it, it involves partnership. Everybody say partnership. partnership. Nation building involves partnership. Nation building always requires partners. There must be communication between the people on the ground in that particular country and the authority of the distant government offices. Okay? We call that the, we call that the, uh, 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 the, the state house. Okay? Uh, the secretary of state is, for us, the chief, the chief foreign ambassador. Under the secretary of state, the, the uh, uh, secretary to the UN reports to the secretary of state. All the ambassadors that we have in all these different nations, they, ref they report to the secretary of the state. And of course, the secretary of state is the chief foreign officer who represents the interests of the country or the, or the president. Y'all with me here? And so in order to do nation building, this nation to come and change its norms and values and policies, there needs to be communication between the new nation that we're trying to affect and the nation who's trying to exert its influence. And the intermarry between those are ambassadors. Look at 2 Corinthians 5th chapter verse 20, and I'm reading the Amplified Version. It says, so we 
are ambassadors for we are ambassadors for Christ. Y'all see that? As though God were making his appeal through us. So we represent God in the earth. We represent the nation of God in the earth. We, as Christ's representatives, that that Bernier says his personal representatives, plead with you or beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So you need to understand, when you got saved, you now represent heaven. I'm, go, I'm not going to have time to go into this the way I want to this week. I'm going to continue next week. But this is a rhetorical question. How, how are you representing? Rhetorical question. How are you representing? Are you repping well? When people hear you, do they hear your opinion or they hear heaven's opinion? When people look at you, do they see you or do they see a representative of the kingdom of God? Rhetorical. We're going to get deep into that next week. As nation builders, we represent heaven on earth. We represent the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, y'all need to understand the regular earthlings, that's not their prayer. Our prayer should be that earth starts looking more like heaven. Our prayer should be that the kingdom of God has more dominion and more authority and more influence in the earth than culture, than rap music, than the person who's at the top of the, the Grammy charts. Oh, y'all don't like me now. So God wants us to, God wants to use us as his nation builders on earth. Partnering with God builds nations. It moves the earth forward. And it even shapes history when we partner with God. Hebrews 11 and 3, we all know the scripture or read it or heard it. Hebrews 11 and 3, New King James says, by faith we understand. Everybody say by faith. Said by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now you didn't understand. You, you, you got to spend a little time in that scripture because the whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is talking about what men were able to do through faith. So when you look at the context, so if you just read this here, you think this is just talking about what God did. Hebrews 11 and 3 is not talking about what God did in the world. It's talking about what men were able to do with the word of God in the world. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, watch this, by men speaking the word of God. So that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear or are visible. The Amplified puts it this way. By faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. So God wants us as his kingdom representatives, as these nation builders in the earth, to fashion things. To put things in order and to put things in line for the, and equip them for the intended purpose by us representing him in the earth. One way that we shape the world is by speaking, declaring, and decreeing God's will in the earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Whatever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. God said, in order for me to get involved, I need you to speak some things, and, and I'll back you up. Yeah. Pastor Marcy was telling her story a couple of weeks ago about, about being in the, in, the, in the fight, and her sister going down there making a fight. We had a similar, y'all heard me, we had a similar story. Okay, I, I had, a, I was, uh, this boy bullied me and took my marbles. 
And I came home crying. I came home crying. My sister said, what you crying about? And I said, Paul Reeves, I'm sorry, I, I, I just made that name up. I don't remember the bully's name, Paul Reeves. I don't remember. I'm just making that up. But Paul Reeves took, took my marbles. And she said, my sister said, wait. And I looked out the window. She said, he said, she said well, we're going down there and get your marbles. I said, he could have them. <laughs> no, it's okay. He, oh, no, we're going to get to marbles. I said, well, when you get marbles, I don't have to fight. She said, well, if you got to fight, you got to fight. And I went down. I said, give me my marbles. He said, take them. And I went to take them. Next thing you know, we, we, we fighting, we wrestling. And, and y'all heard me tell the story before. And, and he would get on top of me and start. He, and, and then, and, and every time he got on top of me, my sister flipped me over. She didn't fight for me. She just made sure I stayed on top. God is not going to fight for you. He said, but if you will fight, I'll make sure you win. If you fight, I'll keep you on top. But you can't run from every fight. Look at your name say, go get your marbles. Gosh, I can't do things in the earth unless you get involved. I'll back you up. So one way we shape the world, but we got to speak, we got to decree, we got to declare, we got to bind, we got to loose. Jeremiah, first chapter 9 and 10, I'm still talking about nation builders. This is how we build nations. Jeremiah 1, verse 9 and 10, then the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth. God calls Jeremiah, he says, I'm a child, I can't talk. I can't even talk for myself, how am I going to talk for you? And the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth and the Lord said, behold, Behold means understand, see, get this. I have put my words in your mouth. He hadn't said anything yet. But God want to know the next time you speak, you're going to hear your words come out of my mouth. I've put my words in your mouth. See, perceive, understand that I have this day. Everybody say right now. I have this day set you over nations. Here we go. And over kingdoms. And I'm putting you over them. And with my word in your mouth, look, look what you're going to be able to do. You're going to be able to root out. You're going to be able to pull down. You're going to be able to destroy. You're going to throw down. See, and see, a lot of us, we're so busy trying to build. We want to build and plant. He said, you got to do some other stuff first. <laughs> First, you got to root out and pull down, destroy, and throw down so you can build and plant. You have to go down before you go up. You have to get rid of the old before you can establish the new. You have to get rid of that old stinking thinking before you can walk in a new life. You're going to have to stop talking about how I was raised and what my mama always said. You have to get rid of all that because I want to do a new thing in your life. And you're going to have to root out some of that stuff. And you're going to have to pull down that stuff. You got to destroy that way of thinking. You got to throw down those idols. Then we can get to building. Then we can get to planning. You know, the early days of our ministry, I don't do it as much anymore. But I realized I was, when I, we started, I was, it was in a very, very, very traditional area. And most of us, we had denominational backgrounds. And we know what we know. And we heard what we heard. And we seen what we seen. A lot of them didn't read the Bible. We, just, we knew church, but we didn't know the word. We know how to march in. And then, then do a special one for the anniversary. We, we know all that. We know the hymns. We know, but, but we didn't know the word. And so I would, my, my model of teaching was very similar to Jesus. Jesus would say, I know you have heard, but I say unto you. You have heard, but I say unto you. And so I, I, would, I would start off teaching. I'd say, now, I know we heard in our whole church, okay, um, that, that, that uh, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Amen. Amen. I know we heard in, in, in our old church that the Bible says we, if you take one step, he'll take two. Everybody say amen. I said, but that dang what the Bible said. It ain't in the word. 
People look and say, what? <laughs> okay, what was I doing? I had to get, I'm trying to get rid of the old so you can receive the new. And so that's what we got to do in order to establish new things. You got to recognize the environment that you're in. You got to recognize the mental strongholds that we've heard. Somebody came, somebody came and uh, said, said one time years ago that, uh, how, how we say it? A stronghold. Now forget it, Matthews. He described the stronghold is a, is, is a place in our mind where lie has lodged, where truth ought to be. A place in your mind where a lie has lodged. That's a stronghold. Well, this is, this, this is what I think. But, that, but that's deception. We, we got to uproot that lie so you can get the truth. And so with the word of God, that's how we start building these nations. We are root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build and plant. That verse in the Amplified says, I have this day appointed you to the oversight of the nations. Oh my God. God. He's talking to a kid who said, I can't talk. I said, what are you talking about? I have appointed you to be the oversight of the nations and the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Jeremiah was not a king. Jeremiah was not the prime minister. Jeremiah was not the secretary of state, the secretary of defense. He didn't have any official role in the government. And yet God said, I have appointed you oversight of the nations. Because this nation building, it requires partnership with God. God said, in order for me to do what I want to do in the earth, to build with you, to do something new in your family, you're going to have to open up your mouth. You're going to have to start saying what's right and what's wrong. You have to start saying, no, we're not going to do that. You have to start saying, no, I don't agree with that. No, you, you got to say, no, that, that's not what the word says. I know this is what we always did, but that ain't what the word says. Fourth thing, nation building involves place, involves people, involves partnership. But nation building, time I have left, I want to spend on this point, is a process. Everybody say a process. Nation building is a process which does not necessarily produce quick results. There is a process to God's promises. There's a process to the promise. And this is my definition. Process is a series of small steps that lead to a big outcome. Process is a series of small steps that lead to a big outcome. The Bible said they dream comes through the multitude of business. Dream comes through the multitude of business. Dream just don't take, just manifest because you had a dream. Malcolm, Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King had a dream, did he not? And his last speech, he was still talking about the dream. And he said, I might not even get there with you before this dream is manifested in the earth. He said, but I've seen it. I've been to that. I've seen it in the spirit. I've seen what it's going to look like one day, but it's not manifested in my earth lifetime. And so a dream is a process. Nation building is a process. Genesis 15, verse 13 and 14. God says to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants, this nation that's going to come out of you, and he's still speaking before he even had one child yet. Your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And they're going to serve them. And those people in the land that's not theirs, they're going to afflict them for how long? 400 years. It actually ends up being 430. And also the nation whom they serve, I'm going to judge. And afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. I want y'all to understand, some of y'all, you believe in God for great possessions, but it might be a process. I don't, you know, uh, I don't understand people who are jealous of people and you're not even in the same lane as them. (laughs) 
How am I going to be jealous of somebody who's making a, a living, a great living, with real estate commissions? And I don't sell real estate. What sense does that make for me to be jealous of somebody who doing something I don't do, I'm not gifted to do, and probably don't even want to do? You, you got to say, the whole concept of jealousy is so perverted. Okay? It's like you being jealous of how fine I am. And we got different mothers and fathers. We got different genes. That don't make no sense. Don't lose the revelation with the illustration. So certain things, it takes time. And what, what, I, what I really got to say about this jealousy thing is that sometimes younger people are jealous of older people. You haven't lived as long as they live. You haven't paid the price that they paid. I showed you all a couple weeks ago my, my credit score. Okay. 820, 830, 840, 810, whatever. It, it, it wasn't that 30 years ago. When I was 30. When I was 4. It took some time. So why are you going to be jealous of my credit score and you ain't paying my bills? Oh, come on, boy. That was good right there. You didn't take my calls from those creditors and work it out and negotiate. There's a process to the promise. Isaiah 16, verse 22. Nation building. A little one shall become a thousand. And a small one, a strong nation. Isn't that wonderful? But he ain't talking about abracadabra. Keep reading, I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. There's a time element to manifestation of promises. And what you should get from people who are walking in the manifestation of the promise is that God is a promise completer. God is a promise keeper. So the Bible says what you do, you don't get jealous of those who got manifestation, he said, follow them who through faith and patience have inherited the promises. Sometimes you need to ask people, how long did that take? Then you'll even know if you even want to believe for that. <laughs> oh, no, well, no, I'm not, well, no, I don't, maybe I don't want that. Well, yeah, it took me 30 years, to, oh, oh, okay, well, uh, Little one shall become a thousand of a strong nation, but it's going to happen in time. That verse from the New Living Translation says, the smallest family will become a thousand people. Mm. And the tiniest group will become a mighty nation. Can I keep reading? At the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. Amen. Oh, my God. See, but, but, I want, but God said, I want you to don't get stuck that it's going to stay the way it is. I want you to know there's a promise that is small, but it can become a thousand. There's a promise that is tiny, but it can become mighty. That's God says what I want you to understand. So nation building, y'all, does not happen overnight. You got to give it time. Even Jesus got frustrated with his disciples because it looked like it was taking too long. Man comes with yeah, finally makes his way to Jesus. He's been through the deacons, the elders, the adjutants, the executive assistant, and everybody else. He said, just give my son. And he comes to Jesus breaking protocol, and he says, I'm sorry, I had to, I, I, I'm trying to go through the protocol, but I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. And Jesus said, bring the boy to me. And he, the, the boy who was, who was possessed by, by a demon and Jesus cast the demon out. And Jesus says in Matthew 17, 17, he said, you faithless and corrupt people. Wow, Jesus. How long must I be with you? He said, why are you all in the slow class? He said, I got three years. I need you to get this. He don't, 
How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. So even Jesus got frustrated sometimes. Looked like stuff was taking too long. But the word of the Lord, the Lord told me to give you as I close this message today is give it time. Look to your neighbor and say, give it, just give it time. Give it time. Be not weary in well-doing. Galatians 6 and 9 says, don't you get weary in doing right and doing good? Because in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Mother Betty used to sing a song, don't stop praying the Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying he'll hear your cry. For the Lord has promised and his word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you. I want to encourage somebody. I know you're building a nation. You're building a family. You're building a business. And look like it's not happening. But the word of the Lord, the Lord told me to close this message with today is to tell you, give it time. Look, somebody say, give it time. Don't you, I, you got to know that I'm doing right and I'm going to keep on doing right because right is going to pay off. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I'm going to keep on praying because he told me men ought to always pray and not faint. I'm going to keep on tithing because he said that he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that I won't have room enough to receive. I'm going to keep on confessing because I know if I confess it, eventually I'm going to possess it. That I got to speak to vision until a vision speaks for itself. I refuse to be weary in well-doing. I'm going to reap if I don't faint. I'm going to reap if I don't leave, if I don't lose heart. I just got to give it some time. <laughs> Titus 1, 1 through 3. It says Paul's a bond servant of God. Titus 1, 1. Paul, a bond servant of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ. According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Any, any hope of eternal life which God, don't look at that, which God who cannot lie. Y'all ever meditated on that? God can't lie. Know why God can't lie? Because he's God. He didn't say he won't lie. He said he can't lie. If God says cows have five legs, somebody said that's a lie. I guarantee the next cow you see is going to have five legs. Because God cannot lie. Whatever he says got to happen. He cannot lie. Now, some of y'all can lie very well. <laughs> but God cannot lie. But God who cannot lie, he promised before time began, but has in due time manifested. I highlighted that. He promised before time began, but he has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Don't give up. Give it time. Look, look at those, verse, those words. So the promise was before time, but the manifestation is in time. I got to hold on to the promise even before the manifestation comes up, shows up. Because the promise was before time, but the manifestation will happen in time. It's got to show up because God cannot lie. If God said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, a great nation got to come out of you. If God says that though your beginning was small, your latter end will greatly increase, your latter end is going to greatly increase. If God said, I'm going to heal you, you are in healing mode right now. God cannot lie. Exodus 23. 9, 29 and 30. God tells the children of Israel, he's, now he got these descendants. They're coming, they've come out of, the, out of Egypt. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. But God said, now let, let me tell you how this going to go now. Because I don't want you to have unrealistic expectations. So let me tell you how to, there's going to be a process to every word that I said. Exodus 23, 29 and 30. God said, now all that land is going to be yours. He said, but I will not drive them all out, all those nations who live there now. The squatters, the occupiers, the Hittites, mosquito bites, snake bites, Moabites, Canaanites, Hittites, Joabites. He said, they're not, going, they're not going to go out in one year. Y'all see that? It's not going to happen in one year because the land would become desolate and wild animals will multiply and threaten you. He said, I need you to get to a place that you can handle every enemy that comes against you. 
I need you to multiply to the place that you're not scared anymore of what tries to threaten you in the land that I said is yours. Oh, I'm preaching here better than y'all responding. Verse 30 says, I will drive them out little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. So every time you start, a, you start gaining territory in your life, say, God fulfilling his word. Every, every bill that gets paid on, oh, God is fulfilling his word. Glory to God. Every time you get to another place in your, in your economic prosperity, you start saying God is fulfilling his word. That verse from the Amplified says, little by little, I'm going to drive them out. I'm going to drive them out before you until you have increased and are numerous enough to take possession of the land. So God is saying, I'm going to build a nation out of you, but you got to give it some time, Abraham. Yeah, you're going to go through some things. You're going to have some people come against you. There are going to be some rough days. There are going to be some hard days. There are going to be some oppression. Oh, yeah, there are going to be people trying to stop you. There are going to be people trying to hold you back. But the more that they try to press you, the more I'm going to multiply you. And so I want you to remember that when it's hard, i got to give it time. Hallelujah. That when it looks like it's not happening, all i got to do is just give it some time. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. God will fulfill his word. God will perform his promises. God will surround you like a shield. Goodness and mercy is following you right now. Look at somebody say, just give it time. Just give it time. Just give it time. Just give it time. Be not weary in well-doing in due season. You won't reap if you don't cave in, if you don't faint, if you don't give in the time, if you don't backslide, if you don't walk away, if you don't get off your knees, if you don't go back, if you don't let go of your confession, if you keep on living right, if you keep on giving right, if you keep on loving right, God will fulfill his word. Just give it some time. Just give it some time. I know it looks hard. I know it looks dark. But God is making a way out of no way. God is bringing you through the rough places. God said, I'll do a new thing in your life. I'll make rivers in the desert. I'll make a highway in the wilderness. Just give it some time. Every little thing. Look at somebody say, God's doing it right now. God's doing it right now. I know that you don't understand why I'm rejoicing over that little thing. But it's evident that the word is working. Because first, when I plant, I go to bed, I go to sleep, I sow my seed, I sleep, and I rise up. I don't know how, but first, God going to cause something to happen. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. I'm rejoicing over my blade right now. That means that my seed has taken root. That means something is growing right now. Give it time. Give it time. Watch God work. Watch God come through. Watch God fulfill his word. Watch God promote you. Watch God increase you. Give it time. Nations shall come out of you. It's just a matter of time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. And you won't say this is that. This is that. This is what God said. This is that. He showed me. He told me. He promised me. It was prophesied. I war with the prophecy. And this is that. Everyone stand there. I'm going to make nations out of you. Greatness gonna come out of you. 
sharing with a pastor yesterday. I was sharing with him about Pastor Chan and the great things that God's done in his life. And he mentioned to me, he said, keep my son in prayer. Because he left, he moved to another state. He said, but I know he's just running. He's running from the call of God in his life. And I begin to encourage him. So just give it time. I don't know what parent I'm talking to. Just give it time. And sometimes, can I tell you, when you hold on to the promise of God, what you're going through right now, you think God forgot. Did, did you remember you told me? Because this don't look nothing like what you said. That's, what, that's why 20 years later, even after God promised, every hand said, well, maybe, maybe he meant to do it. Maybe he did, maybe didn't mean that. Uh, Sarah said, well, may, maybe he wants you to have it through this little, this little young tenderoni we got here. He said, you think? Hey, God, you don't have to help God out. You don't have to help God out. He didn't forget. Talking to one of our members, single young lady in our church who serves one of the other campuses. I said, last time I talked to you, you told me you was involved in a relationship. She said, oh, Pastor, don't even. I said, that's normal. She said, no, that's normal. She said, the Lord exposed some things. And I'm so glad he exposed it. Some of y'all, you're hurt. You need to be glad God exposed what he can expose. She said, but I told the Lord, I said, come on, God. She got to hurry up. She said, I'm 42. Got to hurry up. And I said, daughter, God's not mismanaging your life. She said, Bishop, thank you for telling me that. I'm telling somebody here today, God's not mismanaging your life. You can definitely mismanage. You, you found that out, right? But if you're in the will of God, he's not mismanaging your life. Be faithful and give it time. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I pray for your people today. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a faithful God, faithful to your promises, and you're not a man that you should lie, and you cannot lie. If you said it, you're going to perform it. If you spoke it, you're going to make it good. So I declare in the name of Jesus on this Super Bowl Sunday that we recognize thanks be to God who gives us the victory and always causes us to triumph. I thank you right now for the faith, for the strength, for the fortitude to keep on going even when it doesn't look anything like what you said it's going to be. We trust you. We stand on your word. We'll continue to call those things that be not as though they were. We will root out. We will pull down. We will throw down. We will pluck up so that we can plant and we can build. Thank you that you're doing a new thing in our lives. Doing a new thing, especially in 2023. We don't have to look back and say what it used to be because you're going to exceed that. You're doing a new thing. And thank you, Lord God, that you will hasten your word to perform it. So in the spirit, we see that almond tree with breeds and buds before any of the other trees bud, giving us a sign that you're going to do it in a quick way. You're going to hasten your word to perform it. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God praise.